All right, we're recording. So uh, welcome to everyone and anyone who's watching this. Uh, this is a conversation about taking a cross-border call. And the people that are in this meeting uh, are all non-Canadians who have taken a call to a church in Canada and are currently serving a church in Canada. And so um, part of the goal of this is just to share some of those experiences uh, for the sake of pastors. Uh, if you're a pastor who's looking at taking a call potentially to Canada and you are not Canadian uh, or a church uh, that might be looking to call someone uh, to come and, and be your pastor uh, who is not Canadian and you're a Canadian <laughs> church. Uh, this is for you. We're just going to um, share some experiences, but uh, I'll just give this little disclaimer right at the beginning. Uh, we're going to share experiences here, but none of us are immigration lawyers. Uh, none of us uh, keep 100% up to date with the exact uh, like immigration laws for Canada. Uh, and we all just have our own unique experiences. So we're not going to be shy about sharing our own unique experiences. We're not going to be shy about sharing our own advice, but we really want to encourage you, if this is something you're pursuing in earnest, uh, that you really need to make sure that someone who's capable of looking at your own particular and specific circumstances is able to do that effectively. Uh, so this is not legal advice, I suppose, is how we can start by saying it. Uh, I'll just also uh, start by introducing myself very briefly. I'm Al Postma. Uh, I have pastored a church in uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario, and I am Canadian. Uh, I live in Brantford, Ontario mm -hmm. right now, and I work in pastor church resources, uh, most specifically around classes renewal. Um, so I'll just add a third person then. If, you're, if you are a counselor of a church, uh, this is also for you, a, a classes counselor helping a church navigate some of these waters. Uh, so I'm just going to Follow my screen. I don't know what order you're seeing, but uh, Kelly, if you can just introduce yourself, where you're at, where you're from, uh, those sort of things. So I'm Kelly Sexton. Um, I am an American born and raised in Michigan and currently serving a church in Nanaimo, British Columbia. Uh, came to Canada two and a half years ago. Um, I came on a visitor record um, and I just got my invitation to apply for permanent residency. So I am knee deep in trying to navigate my way through the terrifying express entry process uh, in the midst of COVID, which makes it even more fun. Um, I am single, so I just came by myself. Um, when I came to the border, I showed up with all of the paperwork my church gave me and they gave me a three year visitor record, which expires this coming July, which is why I'm looking at getting permanent residency status. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks, Kelly. And maybe I should just mention too, based on how long videos and stuff can float around, uh, we are in the fall of 2020, fall of 2020. All right. Uh, so there you go. Uh, so when we talk about two years ago, three years ago, and those sort of things, your reference point is fall 2020. Uh, Rick. I'm uh, Rick Rota. I'm the pastor at the Burdett uh, Christian Reformed Church here in Southern Alberta. Been here for about three and a half years. Uh, first time came to Canada was actually in 2008. I grew up in Southern California. I was an associate pastor in uh, San Diego Christian Reformed Church. My wife and I took a call to Ontario in 2008 as a ministry associate. My wife is also an American. We were both Americans. Uh, we showed up at the, uh, the border uh, with all our paperwork, and we met there with the senior pastor at the time, and we got a, a two-year uh, temporary visitor record uh, with the clergy exemption. Uh, then we had, in our time in Ontario, we were in Ontario for seven years. We had three kids born, um, both born in Ontario, but in that process, the temporary visitor part was the easy part and trying to get extensions was the, some of the hardest part. Sometimes we'd apply for, for a year and we'd get six months. Uh, the congregation that I was at was quite large. They had a lot of political connections. We thought that would help. I had wonderful letters and conversations with MPs, but it took a lot of groundwork. 
about four years into that process, one of the elders said, you know, we need to get on this. And they found a immigration consultant that helped us work through our permanent residency process. We could have done it ourselves, but we found having somebody just navigate the process was so uh, just, it, it was a godsend. And uh, we, re, we got, we became, we did the process uh, for permanent residency. We actually, what we did, we called flagged the border. We made sure our kids were safe in Ontario. We went, we drove across to New York, came around, turned back in and uh, got our permanent residency. In 2015, we left Canada so I could finish studying and going for my MDiv. We went back to California and then we came back in 2017 as permanent residents, which made it very nice. However, then we had to apply. We had to make sure that we, we knew every single time that we crossed back and forth into the United States, which with COVID, not a big deal. Living close to Niagara Falls, we crossed many a times, but luckily you could actually apply through both the US and Canadian governments for your records back and forth. And uh, so we got our second permanent residency and now my wife and I are, we are in the process of working on citizenship ourselves so we don't have to deal with the whole back and forth of trying to figure out when we crossed and when. So, cool. yeah. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Jason. Um, so we moved to Canada about four years ago and uh, this was not my first call to ministry, but it, it was my first call to ministry in the CRC. Prior to that, uh, I had planted a church in Milwaukee in an independent, um, kind of a Reformed Baptist type affiliation, and had been there for about eight years and then decided to transfer my ordination into the CRC. I had not yet done, I was in the process of doing that when this church that I'm currently at, which is in the Leduc, Alberta, um, wanted to call me. It was a little complicated because I wasn't yet ordained in the CRC, so technically they couldn't call me as their pastor. So they just kind of created a, a job title for me. They called it Director of Ministries and they, they gave me a, a two-year contract. Uh, and that contract is then what enabled me to cross the border with my family and, and uh, begin working and living in Canada. So then because I had that two-year contract, that gave me two years then to well, not only get ordained so that I could get a call to ministry officially, but also become a permanent resident. That cover everything. My wife is Canadian. And because of that, all of our four kids are, are also Canadian. They have dual citizenship i am currently a permanent resident and um i'm not probably not going to pursue uh canadian citizenship cool thanks jason mm -hmm. how about you brian yeah so i'm uh, currently the lead pastor of first uh, crc in edmonton alberta um i m the way we came was kind of interesting so this this is i'm my first official call sort of um but not really so i, I came i came as uh the pastor of congregational life in rocky mountain house alberta and worked there for three years and that's where i initially crossed the border in 2014 and uh uh so i i was not um i i just came there as kind of an associate position i was actually in the middle of seminary when we made the move uh, uh across so um, it was, yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting. We didn't know completely what to expect. Uh, but again, like, like what you guys, many of you guys have already said, we came to the border with our paperwork and, um, spent a couple hours there, but they let us through on a one year visa. And we, we, <laughs> I would echo your, your thoughts as well, Rick, when, when we had the, the visitor visa, we had, um, we had, we, we didn't have a whole bunch of a hard time, um, renewing it, we flagpoled a lot to do that as American citizens. Um, and that worked. The border agents weren't always happy that we did that, <laughs> but, but, uh, but you can do that and, and it, does, it does work. And so that was, that was for the first couple of years and we applied for permanent residency. I can't remember, 
if it was at the end of our first year or in the middle of our second, but it was, it was fairly quickly while we were, um, we, we just knew that we wanted to stay for at least uh, the foreseeable future. And uh, we, so we applied for permanent residency through the express entry program. And uh, that was, that was an interesting, interesting run. We sat in the pool for about a year before we finally got our, our, um, our number drawn and we were able to apply. And so we eventually became permanent residents. And that's what I am at this point, our entire family is at this point. And took our, set, uh, I guess my first official call after graduating seminary, but um, not, not the first call in the church uh, after, um, after, after I graduated from seminary. So we just stayed here in Alberta after that. So I guess that's the gist of it. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Moses. Yeah. Hi, my name is Moses. I'm the pastor here at First CRC in Barrie, Ontario. Um, we actually moved to Canada in 2010. So I think I'm probably the first one out of all of us to, to move here. But I didn't move here to, uh, to accept the call, but I actually came here to, um, to study at the University of Toronto. So I first came here as a study permit person. Um, and then after a while, um, as I, I think, Al, you pointed out really well that we're not immigration experts, because for those of you who are here, we probably all recognize that like every two or three years, the immigration law here changes. So everything we say may have like, it may mean nothing five years down the road. But anyways, at, at that time, um, we were students who were, were not allowed to work on a student permit. So we had to get a separate work permit to work at churches. Um, and so I applied for a clergy permit, which I think all of us got, which is the R186L work visa. So work, ex work permit exemption. So that's um, what I got. And uh, I worked through that. And then, you know, when I received the call at, at a church, um, I just basically got another R186L. And that basically took me quite a while. Then um, after a while, we were living here for seven years and we realized that we actually really like it here in Canada. Um, I've had all of my three kids here in Canada. So we decided to go through uh, permanent residency, which was really difficult, as all of you say, um, not because the process itself is difficult. It's just very difficult for clergy. And I think we're probably going to talk about immigration a little later on. So I'll, I'll save more for then. Uh, we are currently permanent residents. All three of my children um, were born here. They're Canadians, they're Americans, and my wife is Korean, so they're Korean. So they're Korean, Canadian, Americans. Um, I know, you carry around with passports like this. Thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so basically, um, when I came to first CRC here in Barrie, I was already a landed immigrant. So uh, that saved a lot of time and energy and negotiating with the church. Um, so yeah, I think. And this is not my second call. Oh. Um, so, so uh, I mean, for full transparency, uh, everyone around this table <clears throat> is much more familiar with the immigration process than I am since I'm Canadian. Uh, so I've never had to immigrate to Canada. Uh, but uh, that also gives me the chance to, to ask questions uh, as genuine curiosity. One is, <clears throat> I've heard you talk about, uh, you know, visitor record or exemption or something like that, uh, visa, different things. And then it sounds like some of you came in for three years, some of you they gave two years, some for one year. Did this happen sort of like haphazardly randomly? Or did you say, I would like three years or I would like one, like, what if a pastor is looking at coming uh, in terms of the length of time, like what, again, knowing these processes change and everything like that, but based on your experience, what, how'd that work? So I know from talking with other pastors in our situation, a lot of them were really surprised. I was able to get a three year visitor record. Um, but what we think got it for me was in the initial contract that I had from the church, um, 
I initially came as kind of a term cause, the associate pastor. So on there, they had specifically the dates saying that I was working for this church for three years and that after that we would reevaluate um, my position with this church. Um, and so then seeing that all of the paperwork I got was then able to be through the date that the church guaranteed my call, uh, which was for three years. Mm -hmm. But my yeah. process also, it sounds like some around this table have spent hours at the border. I was in an hour and a half hour. So I could have also just had a border agent who was feeling really, really generous that day. Cause I have it's heard that a lot on that day. Kind of how it goes. <laughs> but I mean, just to be clear, you didn't apply for three years and someone else applied for one year, but you just showed up and they're like, you're good for three years. Well, that's yeah. <laughs> yes and no. So this is what was what I experienced was really difficult. So when we talk about a call from a church, um, we have a, a term call, which a lot of pastors frown upon. And then we have our normal permanent call where a lot of the pastors are. But for immigration purposes, they don't like permanent calls. They actually like term calls because mm. you're a foreigner coming into their country. So they want a date where you will leave. See that's, so, so the church has to get into an understanding that from immigration purposes, they don't want this pastor to come in and live in Canada forever. They want this pastor to come and do their job and then leave because it would be better for, for Canada if they could hire a Canadian pastor for their church. So to fit our situation into the context, it's really important to start exploring once you, you know, start talking about the call that, you know, how long are we, how long do we see ourselves going together? If it's for a more permanent basis, then for immigration purposes, let's say three years, because that's really, I've heard the longest work, um, longest uh, visitor permit that they give out, except for study permits and work permits. And so usually a termed uh, call letter works for the benefit in terms of immigration. Now, you know, does that mean like having two different sets of call? I mean, that's an ethical issue, but from immigration purposes, that works better because you are, you are an, you are a non-immigrant worker. So the expectation is always from the Canadian government that when you come in, you're going to leave. In fact, all the stuff that you bring in with you, like your desk, your your furniture, your car, the expectation from immigration purposes is that once you finish your term, they all leave with you. They all go back to the States. So in, with that type of understanding, it helps a little better where immigration is coming from. Hmm. And I That's would... Right. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rick. No, I totally concur with that. When I came in 2008, we thought, I, I, the senior pastor, he was Canadian, but he'd served in the States. And he said, hey, we need to have it open-ended. And we applied for a three-year when we came, because my wife was also pregnant at the time. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to give you less than that. because it, So I, I concur, like having that wisdom, we thought having an open-ended call would be great. But every single time that we re-upped, re we always did for three years. And then sometimes they'd kick us back and say six months. And we never got that three-year golden uh, three years. And that's why part of it, too, led us to permanent residency as well. So coming from somebody who had the other advice, I think there's much wisdom in putting that term call, too, on there. Because it, it never we never got what we asked for, which, mm. yeah. And you just have to have really good communication with your church. Like they were just really honest with me of like why it was a term call. Um, because the senior pastor I worked around at the time was also an American who had come to Canada. So they had been through this. And so there was this really clear expectation of, you know, like one, we think it's just healthy coming out of seminary for three years for us to just evaluate. Like that is fair to say we're going to see if it's a good fit after three years but also to have the understanding that it's not like, oh, three years and you're out and we're not gonna continue with you. But like, let's start with three because immigration feels comfortable with a term and then we can renew, um, which yeah, like as Moses said, the CRC and term calls, I think it's kind of reframing and just making sure you have really good communication between the pastor and the council of 
why you're putting dates on things. Yeah, and I, I would I would echo uh, the previous thoughts. It, it, the term is, is incredibly important. When we first came over, we did not have a term. And so, I, I mean, I think that, I, I don't think that the, the immigration officers see this all that often uh, for pastors coming across the border like this. So that's one of the issues. So they have to figure out what, how to, how to file this paperwork and, and things of that sort. And, and so that's why we sat, you know, at Sweetgrass for, for I think four hours or, or, or longer. <laughs> and then they only gave us a year. Um, we didn't have a, we didn't have a term date when we first came across. Um, and then, so, but I, I was going to say the term date doesn't guarantee, I think maybe one of you guys said this, uh, I can't remember. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to get that term either. Um, because the second time we came across, they may have been mad that we flagpoled. I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, uh, they, they again only renewed us for a year, even though we had, I can't remember if it was a three or a five year term that we had on the letter, uh, but we did have a, an actual term on there and they still only gave us, gave us a year. Finally, the third time we renewed it, they gave us two years, but we were pretty well in the process of permanent residency at that point. So we didn't really need the two years at that point, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, agreed, Brian, in terms of your point of uh, the, of the immigration officers, maybe aren't too familiar with this phenomenon happening. I'm pretty sure that when I crossed the border, the officer I was working with had never didn't couldn't, couldn't even make sense of like, you're what you're a pastor, you're coming here for two years. Like, what is this? So it's just he just wasn't and super friendly and helpful, but just not familiar with what is going on here. Um, so yeah, I, I just don't think it happens all that often. I was able to get mine easily, but every time since that I have gone to the States and come back to Canada, I have had to explain to customs what it is. Like I was challenged once of they're like, who did you even get this from? Like, we don't think this is a legal Canadian document. And I'm like, the, the seal is your office. It's, it's real. So it's, it is, it's just, it's not familiar amongst border agents. Well, and Kyle, let me, I don't know if I can add to what Kelly is saying. Um, am I am I correct in stating that everyone here except for Al had the R one eighty six one eighty six L visa exemption? I can't I can't remember if it was called that exactly. I just remember them taking this big paper. Maybe you guys had this in stapling it into my passport. And I don't remember the number on it, but I remember them specifically saying it was a visitor record. Like I'm an unpermitted worker. Right. So, so the reason why, the reason why, so just, just for transparency, I have about 12 of those student permit, work permit, all of that. So my understanding, um, and Ontario deals with a lot of this, um, is that, um, Visitor records never last more than a year because you're supposed to be a visitor, right? So the idea for immigration officer for someone to be visiting for three years doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. But the easiest way for to get a clergy permit is the R186L um, non-work permit. So while I was doing this, the last time I got a permit, I didn't get the R186L clergy permit, but what I got was the R205D work permit with an LMIA exemption. Now, those of you who are in permanent residency understand exactly what I'm saying. It is key. In fact, L, I think this is imperative for churches to understand that pastors should get a real work permit, not uh, not a visitor record. Visitor record, it just makes things easier because the church simply has to write out a letter. That's it. An R205D work permit is where the church is actually applying on your behalf for a work permit. And what this basically means that it gives the exact salary amount uh, compensation that the church is offering, the exact end date. And they don't just put it on a letter. They put it in an actual document that they sent to Immigration Canada and it goes into their system. So once the applicant actually comes to the border, they already have all the information and they are 
are, are already exempt from the LMIA, which is basically the labor, labor force, whatever thing that they have to do. Labor market impact assessment. Thank you. That exactly. And this is key for two reasons. Number one, it gives you a bona fide work permit. So you never get any questions at the border. And number two, this is really key out. When you apply for permanent residency, if you have a work permit with an LMIA exemption, that is an extra 50 points on your express entry, which could be the difference maker between you apply for permanent residency and getting it approved and not. So it highly actually incur not only encourages, but say it is imperative for Canadian churches to do it the right way, which is to get a work permit for R205D work permit with LMIA exemption. That's the only thing I've written on my board in bold because this has changed my life. Um, so for anyone who's looking to cross, make sure that they do it. It only costs $250 from the church, but it makes life easier for everyone. And that can be like a term. If the church says four years, then the immigration has officer doesn't really have a reason to not give them four years or three years or whatever the church decides, because that's what the church is saying that they will do. Hmm. I, Moses, I, I totally I echo those experiences and that frustration, because even for myself, temporary visitor record with a clergy exemption, I remember even applying for a new one. And I came across to Niagara Falls, New York to grab some milk and gas, came back. I didn't have my new one, but I had my old one my wife and I, and we were stopped and they said, well, why are you coming back here? And we had a daughter in elementary school and they said, well, you shouldn't even be working here. How come, you, why didn't you take your daughter back to you with, to New York? I said, I'm not even from New York. And she sent you into secondary and you, we had to go through all that process. And I don't know how many times just going back and forth uh, that, that was explaining it because even Niagara Falls and you know that part of the Niagara Peninsula you think this was common and uh yeah it wasn't so i just would have saved a lot of heartache and a lot of a lot of prayers at the border going back and forth so well and having just filled out the express entry application form like they make you think that your job offer will count without an lmia number but it doesn't like no matter how you do the form like i cannot get the 50 points even though I have a job offer and it is LMIA exempt as a pastor, their system doesn't count it. And so I was fortunate that I was able to get enough points elsewhere, but it is certainly more stressful. And it was just, yeah, like, and I asked my church administrator, like, have you guys ever done LMIA? She had no idea what I was even talking about. Um, so I think more knowledge about that, like I would echo what Moses said, of it would just make it easier. And eventually scraping for those points is is crazy important. I remember us scrapping through old transcripts and things of this sort just to try and get as much points as possible and just hope that we were going to get into that range that is when you eventually apply for permanent residency. Because I also, my master's did not count. They said that they don't recognize the... ATS as an accreditation agency. So I did not get points, even though I have a master's. Um, so then when like you're scraping for points and you, there's 50 out of reach, it is very depressing. <laughs> so if I'm hearing this right, as you know, the uninitiated, uh, there's a couple ways to enter in or apply and one is that you can come in as a visitor with a with like a religious worker or clergy or whatever it's called exemption, but you're coming in as a visitor, and you're getting exempted from some of the visitor pieces as a as a clergy, and that's the easy way. Uh, but and and it's a legal way. It's it's easy. It's it's completely appropriate for you to do it, but you can also come in with a work permit just like if you were getting a job at any other business, any other place, pretend you're not a church, you come in as a worker, get a work permit, the church has to apply, blah, 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 blah. But when you do it that way, you enter into the same system that 
immigration deals with every single day rather than the exemption system that clergy can get away with. And it's insurance for your church. Because a year in, we hit financial difficulties. We talked about my going by vocational, and I said, I'm not opposed to it, but legally, I can't work anywhere else. Mm. My current status, I am only allowed to receive a salary in Canada from the church. So mm. by vocational is not an option under my current standing. Whereas if I'd come in with a work permit or once I get permanent residency, there's more options for being able to be by vocational if the need arises. I, Moses, I, I think I think there's something up with your microphone, Moses. I'm hearing like a buzzing and then you spoke. Yeah. Okay. Um, Here we go. I think to to echo off what Kelly is saying. Um, so as you say, um, getting a visitor record is easy because let's say, you know, if if a person came to a monastery here in Canada and they wanted to work in a monastery for for no income, you'd still get a visitor record as a clergy. But if you want to come in as a work permit defined clergy, it's hard because the church has to guarantee that your salary meets at least the median plus 10 percent of salary for all clergy. Now, mm -hmm. for most CRCs, this is not a problem, um, but that's one thing that the church, as Kelly pointed out, has to come up with basically it's a promise just like a call letter is and so they have to be ready to do that and that's why you know some churches kind of against it because they're kind of on the hook for it but that's really what the call letter is there for so it really makes no difference but it just keeps things you know more on record however as as um as non-canadians even if we do have a work permit that's a closed work permit. So you can only work where your work permit tells you you can work. So until you get a permanent residency, if, if, you know, if, if my work permit said first CRC Barry, that would be the only place that I could work. Um, so, I mean, regardless, it, that's the issue, but that's the difference between the visitor record and, and the work permit. Work permit is defined terms in terms of your compensation and salary. Visitor record, you could be paid like a dollar an hour and you could still get a visitor record because you're, you're, you're for charity. So, you know, they may pay for your housing, but maybe they don't give you anything. You'd still get a visitor record. And so that's another big discrepancy between the two that the churches don't realize. Rick, you were gonna jump in there too. Well, I, speaking of like coming into Canada, my question when I was thinking about this was when you initially visited your church, when we first came, we were living in Southern California. We flew to Buffalo, New York. We were picked up by an elder from the church who said, okay, we're going to go across the border. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, you're coming to visit uh, to go see the sites, but you can't mention that you're actually going to check out a call because we were close enough. And that was when it first hit me and my wife, whoa, this is going to be a little different because we just kind of came in just, oh yeah, we're moving and we're going to check out this call. So I'm wondering how your experiences were, and maybe this is helpful in this conversation. What have other churches done? Because all of a sudden my wife and I were thrown into this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Came to the border. Oh yeah. We're going to visit Niagara Falls. We know so-and-so and we've known them for years, which, you know, mm -hmm. ethics of that uh, rather iffy, but I don't even know how churches do that. Cause when we came to Alberta, we were already permanent residents and yeah, we just showed up and boom, right. but. And in that too, my my sense is, I mean, I've done some cross-border stuff just uh, within the position that I'm in. And I think uh, we tend to assume certain things about crossing the border, you know, even like, oh, we're going to buy some things and you better not declare it, you know, but really it's like, but you can, like, it's totally legal to buy things in the, in the States as a Canadian and bring them back. So why would you even bother lying? And that's where I wonder too, it, you know, it's perfectly legal, I think, non-immigration lawyer, but for someone to come into Canada on a B-1 uh, with the understanding that they are looking at the potential of, of pursuing a position in Canada. And there's no, there's no reason to lie about it. Um, but lying about it and getting caught lying about it basically seals the deal that you will not ever get that position in Canada. But yeah, I'd love to 
hear a little bit more, especially for those who are in the States or wherever else and they're looking at, they're, they're just in the early conversation with a church, maybe coming to visit at some point. Uh, what are the things to navigate? What are the things to be aware of uh, even in the initial conversations? I think uh, something that didn't come up in conversation um, that would have been helpful is just the reality of this process. Um, I mean, like my church really highlighted like, hey, look how easy it is to get a visitor record. Like, it's so great that as an American, you can just come to Canada. It's going to be really easy. And like, for me, that was but now I'm on like month four of trying to navigate express entry and I have given up and decided I'm going to hire an immigration lawyer to consult with me because I am so overwhelmed and I'm asking questions of my church about LMIAs and details and I'm trying to get reference letters from my former churches and they don't even know what I'm talking about so I'm having like the amount of hours and just emotional toll that goes into this for me to be able to stay and continue pastoring my church um, is something, I don't know that it would have made a difference, but I think like it would have been nice to know, like it might be really stressful and that's not just you. This is just a crazy process. And by the way, it's going to take months so don't worry about waiting until you get enough days for two years, like start this ahead of time. <laughs> Just that sense of like scope. Um, because if you're going to stay beyond your visitor record, like this is just a reality of pastoring in Canada as an American is, and vice versa, you know, like this is going to be a part of your being able to pastor. Probably asking, I mean, to echo a little bit of what Kelly's saying, they're probably asking if they can, uh, if they if they would be able to contact or enlist a consultant along the way would be, because we were able to, I mean, it was, we, we wrestled with a lot of stuff, talk, tried to talk to a lot of people, um, but there was, uh, there was a, a lot of questions about how things were going to work. I remember when we, this was horrible. We, when we first tried to renew our visitor record, we tried to do it by mail and we mailed our passports in with it. That was not good. Um, they actually said that if we did that again, they would take them and shred them. And <laughs> I, I don't know, it was, it was a little frightening, um, but, but having a, having a consultant of, of some sort would be, uh, would be useful to at least talk to. And when you speak of even two, I remember when, when our temporary visitor record expired, we would mail them in. Uh, we just, they don't kick, the, the, we just stayed. Uh, we didn't go to this US, we just stayed till our permits came back in, uh, which was a little, at first a little difficult because all our family was in the States, but it's not like they're gonna come after you. We kept on paying our taxes, we kept on being employed and we just, waited and uh felt a lot like the biblical stories but uh yeah I, I at first it was that first time oh no it expired what's going to happen well you know they're, they're not sending people to come send you back to the states uh they they just want to make sure things are in line so yeah i completely agree with all of those comments about the importance of um getting experts and consultants in on it it's just it's complicated and in my case, I was fortunate enough that uh, there's a number of farmers uh, the foundation, and they were quite familiar from having brought in immigrant labor to work on their farm. Uh, they knew exactly the process of how to do that. And that's why we didn't go the clergy visitor route, but because they, they knew what the process was to bring in someone. So, but it, you know, had we not had that expertise, we would have made a number of mistakes along the way. And then also, the process. So I, I came on a two-year contract knowing that, okay, now I have two years to transfer my ordination and to become a permanent resident. But even that, like, it's helpful to have a consultant. Like, 
that's not an easy process. And you're busy being a pastor, right? So it's not like I had all this time to figure out what the process. So again, our church hired a, 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 um, an immigration lawyer as a consultant. And it's just nice to have an expert on your side. Like, I, th I think that's really important. I'm curious, uh, uh, this may not be a fair question, especially since it's all pastors sitting in this room, okay? But uh, when it comes to hiring a, an expert, consultant, lawyer, whatever, uh, is it a fair assumption for a pastor that the church does that and picks up the tab or is it a fair assumption that you do that and you pick up the tab or somewhere in between? I'm not sure what your experiences are in terms of the finances. And I'm curious if you can even just give a, even a ballpark sort of sense, like what kind of tab are we even talking about? Yeah, for me, I would, in my opinion, at least in my situation, we felt like it was fair for it to share the load with the congregation because partly were, they were bringing me there, but also in terms of securing the permanent residence, well, I stand to gain from that personally as well. All of a sudden now, a lot of doors open up for me because I'm a permanent resident. And so we decided um, with, my, with our council that we would share the, the burden on the cost of that. That seemed fair to me. And it was, it was not cheap. It, the, the, the tab I think came out to like $3,000. Canadian dollars, I'm yeah. assuming. Yeah. So I am just paying for it on my own right now. Um, our church financially, I don't, I know the money's not there. Um, but I'm also looking at, because of where I am in the process of when I decided that I wanted legal help, um, I'm like gathering everything myself and then we'll just pay a lawyer to review my application before I send it in. And then like they will look over all of my documents and then give me a report of if there's changes or if there's things missing. And so it's just a professional double check before I submit it. Um, and that's about 550 Canadian. The price of a, just to have a consultant is a, is a little bit cheaper. We met with a consultant when we were going through the process of permanent residency and our, our church in Rocky picked up that cost, but it was only, if I recall, 200, 250, something like that. It was not horrible. Mm -hmm. Now the price of permanent residency though was, it was crazy expensive when we were going through that process. I think so if if we're going to talk about that some it's um you are i mean you of course like we're in alberta we 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 have our alberta health but it doesn't cover an immigration exam you have to pay for your own immigration exam and uh we're i mean we're a big family um i we were a family of seven we were six at that time and um so we had to pay for all of us for these individual medical exams, uh, as well as your application fees and um, uh, an English test, things of this sort in order to get those points up. And um, so all in all, we were, if I'm not mistaken, we were probably well over 3,000 just on permanent residency alone. The Congregation, though they they what they did is they gave it to us in a they they said they would cover the cost in a forgivable loan. So if I stayed at the church for X number of years, they would forgive that amount. But if I left, which I actually did, I uh, left Rocky to come here to Edmonton. I just had to pay back the the amount that was left over uh, from from uh, the loan. Yeah, all the little costs add up of like, there's the fingerprinting and the FBI cost to get your criminal re history record. Um, there's the medical exam, which yeah, like is not covered under your provincial health. And because I live on the island, like I'm driving down to Victoria multiple times because there's only certain doctors that can do these exams. Um, and it's either that or the mainland. Um, 
And then, yeah, like, I think it was $200 for my language exam as a native English speaker to show that I speak English, you know, and it would be more if I had also wanted to do French. And then I think it was like $350 to certify my bachelor's degree to be able to get points for that. Uh, and that's not even getting into the like 1300 application to actually submit my application and have it processed. Mm -hmm. I agree with all that. And uh, I would just say from the other point for me and my wife, especially me, it was a very humbling experience growing up in the States. And I, I had a very much a high view of that citizenship. And I came to Canada and I remember going through immigration clinics and I sat there with the least of these. And it was a humbling experience and it opened my eyes in ways that I would have never ever imagined. Uh, so it is, I find it was a lot of work, but it was transformational in its way that I was not special. God does not have one citizenship. And uh, it, it, it was a good, it was good. It was, it was, it was, it was a lot of work, but it was, I think it made me a more holistic person if I could, you know, add across the fees. And so now I, I truly am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So Uh, so one of the things I'm hearing through some of the conversation is um, just even about the finances of it. It sounds like each of you that shared a bit had some different uh, experiences within your church. But one of the things that sort of comes to the fore is there was at least uh, some clarity or expectations on who was responsible for what or how that all worked out. Like Jason, you talked about, you know, you decided together to split it. Brian, you talked about a forgivable loan. There's just, I guess maybe what I'm hearing is an encouragement to pastors and churches who are going through this. There might not be like, you should do this or you should do that in terms of how this is financed, but you really should have a conversation about the fact that this is not free. This is gonna cost something. And at the very least, uh, you should have some shared expectations on who's going to cover those costs uh, because entering in, but also then maintaining your status, moving into permanent residency and so on. They, it just, there's like Kelly, you said, there's just like this trickle of costs that, that adds up. So, um, we have about uh, eight minutes left. Uh, and so I guess uh, one of the things I want to do is uh, recognize that I can ask some questions, but uh, you all probably have better questions even than I do. And uh, I guess what, what question or questions do you think any pastor who's looking at moving to Canada as a non-Canadian and any church who's looking to call a non-Canadian pastor, uh, even if you don't give the, the answers to them, what are some of the key questions that they need to be asking? I would say with the biggest thing for us, my wife and I, when we came, we, we, we lost, the credit system is completely different in Canada. We may all have a visa, but we were completely shocked that well, we had to get a secured visa. We had to put a thousand dollars down and we had that, you know, growing up as a Dutch immigrant, like finances were everything. And I, we had to get a loan from my parents so we could have a credit card. And then we had saved up money in California. We thought we could buy a house. Well, not so much with the temporary visitor. Uh, you got to put a crazy amount down um, unless you want somebody, you know, in our, in our case, there was somebody in the congregation whose wife had a dream that we needed help. And I was very weary of that, but we were able to buy a house because there was a dream. And because the finances, we had to, we had to rebuild from the beginning, uh, scratch. Mm -hmm. and, but we also maintain still our US credit cards, we still kept it. We have uh, them in my in-laws, sent to my in-laws house because we wanna keep, you, you have to maintain that balance too. And even when we moved back to the States, we kept our Canadian credit cards going so that if we moved back, we would have that, that uh, system. We had no clue. That was like, what? I Having those phone calls. Uh, so that's another big key. Finances are completely different. We also still file taxes uh, in the US through a Canadian from the first year, we didn't do that. 
but we, we find it incredibly beneficial, especially in the time of COVID. We also did receive a US stimulus as well as a Canadian stimulus, which had no clue that was gonna happen, but uh, it, it does cost money. And, uh, but if you're on the fence, I know others that waffle with that, but for us, it's been a good experience keeping that because the US is one of those few countries in the world that still makes you file taxes back in there. But social security and the Canadian one, if you file back and forth, there, there's a lot of joint agreements, big things to know about, things that we had no clue about when we first moved in that we just kind of treaded through, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would echo that of like, what is your plan for helping that pastor settle when they start? Because yeah, like you have no credit when you come here. And like, I didn't even qualify for a credit card until I had been here six months. So it's like, and that was probably just the bank I was at, but it's this conundrum of like, I can't build credit, but I also can't, don't have credit. Um, and I think the other conversation is, um, looking at the difference in the dollar in terms of finances of like what American debts does the pastor have and is a Canadian salary going to be enough to cover whatever you owe in the states um, and it should be but it's just with the drop in how much the Canadian dollar is like it's something to think about um, before you commit. I'll just say something that that could probably be true for somebody for a pastor taking a call completely across the country, just as it could be true for somebody taking a call in a different country um, is just to bear in mind the connections piece, right? Because we came with a, a, a young family um, and lots of kids and we are moving, I mean, away from our family, um, nobody around that we know. And, and uh, so the connections piece, I mean, we, we, we hope and pray that the church is gonna be the church and surround people like that. But sometimes, you know, I, we, we've had the experience where people just kind of go about their lives and they just don't think about, about how hard it is for somebody to leave their family, their former friends, everybody behind, um, I mean, you don't have babysitters anymore. You don't have uh, any sort of connection pieces. So it's just that much more, um, or it can be that much more lonely and difficult. And now you're coming into a different culture, a different context. Um, it, can, it can be quite challenging like that. I think I would probably agree with what was said regarding the finances piece. That was a surprise to us. We knew immigration would, you know, have challenges, but international finances, I mean, we just had the hardest time securing a mortgage and, and it, we did not expect that at all. So that's something to be aware of. But I would also say on top of that, that it's totally worth it. Like it's doable. Like if someone heard this conversation it was like, oh, well, I didn't realize it was so complicated. I would say, yeah, uh, there are some things that are tricky about it, but like it's doable. Like it's to it's totally worth it. Never can let that optimistic side go, can you, Jason? <laughs> I think yeah. Like I would echo like it's totally worth it, and I think for me it's just been humbling. Of like, I don't like asking for help. And I think that, that I'm not alone in that as a pastor, you know, like often we're kind of expected to be the expert, but like, I am not an immigration expert. I'm not a cross border tax expert, you know? And so like paying for help from all of these specialists that I never needed when I lived in the States, you know, and just asking people in my congregation, do you have connections, um, you know, of legitimate lawyers? And yeah, just knowing that, yeah, like, it is worthwhile. Moses, any final questions or words from you? Well, I think, I think Jason, I think you, you mentioned it um, <clears throat> very beautifully that, you know, we, we talk about a lot of obstacles and we talk about obstacles because we, we want to make it work. We, we really enjoy um, the ministry here in Canada. We enjoy, you know, living in Canada. We enjoy uh, working with the churches here. It's a, 
it's a total different context. You know, some of the things that we see our, our colleagues south of the border wrestle with, we don't have to wrestle as much here in Canada. That doesn't mean we don't have our own issues that we have to deal with here in Canada. Um, I, I think it's key to understand that, um, that, that it's part of a journey together. And, and I don't mention this just only about bringing pastors from the States into Canada or Canada into the States, but the church I feel is responsible for making sure that they train and equip the next generation pastors. And that's what you're doing, not only in calling someone, but bringing someone to, to work in this context. And so, although it's difficult, there's, you know, a lot of professionals here is like, you know, Rick Kelly, Jason, Brian, you know, you've all gone through this process and I have too, and, and it's doable. And there's plenty of those who have walked before us. Um, like the church I'm at has a tradition of hiring American pastors. I don't know why, but they just are. And so um, there, there is beauty in that. There's a lot of information out there. So, you know, I, 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 I'd encourage pastors, um, potential pastors who want to come to Canada to reach out uh, to other colleagues and uh, for churches to also reach out um, and, and, you know, try to make this work because it, it's not a lot of extra work to make it work. It, it is more work, but it's just only a little bit more. And so uh, I would encourage um, you to do that. One, one kind of parting thoughts. And similar to the states, each of the province have their own regulations. And we've talked about immigration, which is across the country. But for example, public health is different. Each province has their own public health. Like Ontario is different from Alberta. Alberta is different from BC. In Ontario, you have to reside here for 90 days before you qualify for provincial health. So the church has to, you have to come to an agreement with the church to make sure that they will cover that, that, that you know, God forbid nothing happens, but that, that you do have insurance. And also to make, you probably all heard that, you know, when, when a pastor comes, their spouse can work here. Well, no, technically that's not true. If you want to work here, you need to get a work permit. So when you cross the border, make sure your spouse applies for, for an open work permit, because it's so much better when you get it at the border than trying to get it inland. Mm. One final thing. Um, when, you, when you do come in, you'll probably bring your car as well. Remember, everything you bring in is tax exempt when you bring it in. But as I said, when you're done, they're supposed to go back. Um, but yeah, don't feel like you have to throw away everything when you're coming in. Everything you bring in is tax exempt. So make sure all of that is itemized so that you don't give the immigration officer a hard time. That's all I have. Those are some very solid, quick parting shots. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for anyone who's uh, been watching this uh, and has made it to the end here, uh, just want to remind you, this is not a full, complete conversation. This was just uh, several people with experience in it talking about their experience. Uh, and so there's probably still some questions that you have. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to, to connect. It sounds like it's across the board, connecting with an immigration consultant or lawyer or someone who's professional who knows what they're doing is probably a really great, uh, just a really great idea. Uh, as well, I think um, some of you or all of you, I'm not sure, but there's another list as well. Uh, Pastor Church Resources, at least currently in fall 2020, has a list of uh, some pastors who are willing to talk uh, with you, you know, we have their email addresses and phone numbers, uh, and they're willing to share a little bit more about their experiences. So even if uh, one of the people around this uh, table here, this virtual table, has said something that you're like, ah, just like a little bit more information, uh, we can help uh, you get a little bit more information from them, at least from their experience uh, as well. So I just want to thank uh, the, the five of you for being part of this. Uh, this has just been a really great conversation and I know it will be helpful. So thank you all. And uh, for those of you watching, thanks for watching. Thank you, Al.